because the camera's on, bro. Why are you lacking probably because the camera's on? No. Day one. I'm a huge fan. And I'm not just saying that to get you to hire me. I've always been a big fan of film. I mean, all kinds. Greg Starr calling from Variety to congratulate you on your big win. You win. Don't forget about me. Welcome, Chisa Hutchinson and Anjanu Ellis. Uh, off the subject, I am so, we're so excited to have you both here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the subject? And, you know, Chisa, this is, I don't think I've ever seen, um, I've, I've seen a lot of your plays, but uh, I've never actually seen uh, a movie, you know, like one of your screenplays turned into a movie before. Can, one of my favorite things about it was that it builds and it ends up almost being like a play. And can you talk a little bit about, about Yeah. yeah. Um, well, first, you haven't seen in any of my movies because this is the first one to be produced. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a this is yeah my first feature, and um, and it feels like a play because it because it started as a play. <laughs> um, it started as basically homework in graduate school um, <laughs> for my playwriting class at NYU with uh, with Renner Prof. I started this play because um, I had seen a a news piece, I guess you can call it, some kind of journalistic something. I don't even know what to call it. Some, a journalist decided that she was going to be homeless for two weeks and um it just struck me as really uh, <laughs> it just struck me as, as as weird and um not it's just it was icky it's just something something was really icky about it just watching this woman like you know walk around and and eat out of trash cans and and curl up on the street but like with a camera crew following her around and commenting on it you know like oh this is what these people do like this is how life is for these people kind of thing and i was just like that is nasty like i don't you are i don't think you're making the point you think you're making <laughs> by by doing this piece so um yeah i just wanted to i you know i was sort of ruminating on that and i wanted to write something that um that got at that you know that, that sort of walked that line between um exploration and exploitation is um how i've been putting it and then um yeah, and then Phil came, popped into my head, <laughs> um, the the main character in the subject, and um, yeah, just just ran with it. What, and what does it feel like to pretend to like put your head, put yourself inside a white man's head? Be, <laughs> because it's I feel like especially in grad. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's, it's, it's rough in there like it's, it's not it did not come easy and I gotta say like this is more than any other um script that I've ever written like I've um this one I did the most drafts of because I was not kind to, to Phil in, in previous drafts um he was he was a lot a lot less likable um, in earlier drafts and I was just um, and with each draft I was like really just trying to all right let me just humanize this guy you know like he doesn't think of himself as a bad guy so I, I have to I have to treat him thusly uh, so yeah and, and, and I think um, yeah I think this final iteration is is okay he's not like He's not a total bad guy, you know, but you also are a little bit like, oh, 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 bad choice. Oh, wrong choice. Oh, no, dude, don't, no, not that, right? Um, so yeah, it's been a struggle. It's a struggle at, in getting inside the white man's head. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't even want to imagine that. I feel like we kind of have to if we're gonna survive at this point. Um, yeah, just like what are y'all, what are y'all thinking, and how can we change it? <laughs> like, how, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Anjanu, uh, this character Leslie in in the subject, in a way, joins 
a family of sorts of characters that you have been playing recently. You know, include, I love Mrs. Hunt and Beale Street so much. And I also you're- I like Miss Hunt too. <laughs> and also, you know, uh, obviously Hippolyta and the character that you played in When They See Us. And you have been playing uh, mothers basically who don't understand, and I mean, who can't fathom the way in which the world is treating their children. And watching this subject, especially after, you know, all the policemen who murdered Breonna Taylor just went home back to their normal lives without any sort of justice being made, struck me like, you know, I felt Leslie's pain even more. It was so harrowing to watch the movie after that had happened. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about this, about the sense in, you know, through your work and trying to convey the pain of seeing injustice constantly, you know, happen. Um, well, I, I don't shy. I love playing, I love playing mothers. You know, I, I, I love playing mothers. I think, I think I'm sure other actors don't want to do that like they feel like it ages them or something like that they want to you know be seen as just the, not just I don't want to demean anybody or reduce anybody to anything but I guess they think it makes them less um less sexy I don't know how, what other way to say that you know and, and and I say that because it, and it's not a reflection of their character they probably actors I think probably make that choice because it's such a limit in terms of how the limitate such limitations that are put on women in terms of casting in the first place so it's like you a mother or you're a sex pot you're it's I it's so limiting right you know what I mean and um I I have never I've never felt that pressure at all I've always gravitated towards things that I just like doing or gravitated toward checks so I can keep my rent paid or keep somebody else's rent paid, you know? Um, so I've never, I've never felt that. And I, and I, and I, I love playing, I love playing women that when they walk in the room, the, 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 they change the atmosphere in the room and all of these women uh, in some way, um, in some way do that. And I also will say, um, that I, um, you know, I, 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 you're right. I am playing these mothers who cannot accept how the world is treating their children. You said that so gracefully, you know. Um, and I approach each mother in terms of her own experience. You know, Hippolyta, Hippolyta um, is not Sharon Salam, and when they see us, and none of them are Mrs. Hunt <laughs> if Bill Street could talk, you know? So um, I try to meet them where they are and um, and go for their, go go on their rides. And I just, I enjoy doing that. I, I enjoy doing, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do, if that makes any sense, yeah. Like, uh, do you feel like, you know, back to what Jose was speaking about, about like reflecting these real life mothers who have also seen their children be unjustly harmed. Like, yeah. do, you, do you feel like you're representing them or you're giving that, or you're influenced by them? Well, well, that's why I guess, I think that's why I said that I, I don't, I don't want to make these women a monolith. And I think that's what happens when these, when you see these characters, when the way that they are portrayed you know, it, it, it's it's almost it, it's it's a trope. The grieving mother, the mother, black woman grieving over her murdered child. You know, it's it it's become a trope at this point. And the reason why it's become a trope, first of all, it happens. It's less that it's happening in the world, but it's also because of, like I said, the limitations that that the limitations of the imaginations of the writers. So this is something that I wanted to say before. What I think that Chisa did and did it so wonderfully is that, um, I don't know, in the, in the, in the gamut of, how, of, of, of white supremacy, where does Phil fall? You know what I mean? And so he falls in this like really annoying <laughs> K 
cavity of white liberalism, you know? I'm doing the good thing here, you know what I mean? And they are, my God, you know, they, they, they are as much an enemy as someone who wears a hood on their, on their faces. Um, and so what's important that important in what Chisa did is just sort of exploring that idea of white liberalism and showing what it looks like and revealing itself to itself and saying, no, you're not what you think you are. And I think that's the voice that Leslie is, you know, that's what she, that's the, that's her voice is speaking to that assumption of what's good, of what they think is their goodness. If that, yeah, yeah. There's something that I, I thought about a lot when I was watching the film and it's like, I, I always get very angry when I watch documentaries and there's this thing that I call the lie of objectivity where like the filmmaker is like, I'm on my pedestal and I cannot intervene. And then they just let horrible things happen in front of them, but because they're doing their big art project and they're doing something, you know, more important than life, so to speak, according to them, they almost like forget their own humanity. And both of you as artists who move you know, on stage and on screen, I wonder if there are things about the idea of objectivity in theater and in film that you're like, that makes no sense whatsoever. Like, let's try to like dismantle this. She's a... Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, I I very much own a perspective when I'm writing stuff. I don't, um, I try not to like beat people over the head with it, you know? I try to like make it as, as nuanced and um, digestible, I guess, or like, um, I just, because I really, I want to invite people to metabolize it, you know, like in a way that it, um, yeah, so so do I have a perspective? Yes. <laughs> like um do I own it? Yes. Um but I I'm, I'm I am very careful about um how I share it. Um because I don't want to be condescending. I don't and I also don't want to preach to the choir. You know, I don't want it to be just like, well, you all share my values. <laughs> So let me just speak to y'all, you know, it's, it's, I, I really think about how I can get people who don't really um, give a shit about people like me to give a shit about people like me. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, um, and, I, and, and I start with the presumption of like, okay, you don't share my values. Like you're not a believer in, you know, maybe even you think you are like Phil does, right? But you're you're not actually a believer in um you know in this in this, you know, all lives are precious, you know, all life has value. Like you you maybe think you do, but let me show you how you don't actually. Um yeah, and I, I, I think it's important to earn, to own your perspective when you're creating art because otherwise what's what's the point <laughs> what you know what what's um what's your agenda I guess like I feel like all art should have an agenda damn it <laughs> and, um and if it doesn't then it's just sort of so I don't know what is that self-indulgent fluff right I don't know she said, I think you should, I would love for you to tell that story that you told me about the journalist in, I think that this story happened in somewhere in, I sound really ignorant right now, somewhere in Africa. Where uh, it was either Rwanda yeah. or Uganda. Yeah, you should tell that story because I think it feeds into that question. Yeah, um, the Pulitzer Prize winning photographer who took that picture of the young girl, the toddler, she's totally emaciated and she's um, just sitting in the dust, um, crying. You know what I'm talking about, right? Kevin yeah. Carter. So he, um, like in an interview, I think said something like, yeah, I waited, I waited, to, God, this is like, it upsets me every time I think about it, but like, yeah, I waited 20 minutes for the 
the vulture to spread his wings because there's a vulture like behind the child just waiting for her to die, right? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I waited 20 minutes for the vulture to spread its wings. It never did. So I just took the picture and went on my way. <laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> I have no, I have no words, right? Or like all the words that I had, you know, I put into the play. <laughs> <laughs> the play of the subject because because that's how do you how do you let that happen like how how and how does that not affect your soul which apparently it did because then short you know just a few months after getting the Pulitzer for taking that photo he committed suicide right so there is some there's danger right in not acknowledging the humanity of your subjects um, there's there's always the danger of you losing your own humanity, right? When you treat other people, not as people, right? But like as objects there for your, um, for the purposes of your art or for the purposes of um, your, I don't know, like a, your ego, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah, and and you can't you can't you can't let your ego win out over your humanity. I just can't. Yeah, I wanted to speak to that a little, uh, just a little bit. I'm, I'm I I had to get you to tell that story, Chisa, because I just think that's so important, you know. Um, and one of the reasons that I was like, this 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 is what you're writing is is really important, and I wanted to be a part of that. But I, I I'm interested also. Um, in the idea of spectator and witness, so so the so dude who took the picture, he was he was being he was being a spectator. But I think about the young woman who took the video when George Floyd was being was being tortured and murdered, right? And and she was a witness, and she knew that her witness was going to. Uh, was important. It had value. People needed to know what was happening to this man. Um, and so this, in terms of this idea of, you know, uh, objectivity, you know, I think that, I think as people who make, make art or make, take the pictures or do the films or are an actor, or whatever, we have to be clear that we're not just spectators, that we are witnesses. Because if you're a witness in, to me and my imagination, you are you are you are implicit in what's happening you know you are implicit complicit you are a part of what's happening you are you bear responsibility for what's happening you know and um yeah i i think that's important and i think i think that that's what chisa speaks to in in the subject and i think that that's what leslie is saying to to phil that my son needed a witness, but you acted as you acted as a spectator. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think the difference. I think the difference for me between a spectator and a witness is stakes, and like what is at stake for the person who is observing, right? So, you know, someone who has something to lose you know, so who, someone who has something at stake, right, if they intervene, if they, if they step in and help, right, if they, if they could lose something, if, they're, if they have to sacrifice something, um, and they're willing to do that, like, I feel like that's a witness. If it costs you nothing to help, and you still don't help, you are a spectator, right? <laughs> like that, if, if you, you could so easily, right, just like help this other human and you Pick don't. Pick up that baby. Take that baby to get some, get get some baby a banana, something, yeah. right? Like something, just, uh, it costs you nothing, right? Whereas if you don't help, <laughs> it's, you have just thrown away your humanity. But you know, that's, I, I don't know, it just, it, it, I think that's where the line is for me is um, people who who've got that skin in the game, right? Like people who who are like, okay, like that the the young lady who who took the video of George Floyd and she's in there, she's pleading, you know, and she's 
probably just as at I mean, it could have been her next, right? With the neck, with a, with a with a knee on her neck, right? But she's she's in there and she's trying, right? With within her, you know, trying not to get killed, right? Or trying not to like draw that that kind of attention to herself. Um, but she's still she's still in there, trying and um, and you know the bravery the bravery that that takes um, and the humanity that that takes like that is an exercise in in humanity right there like. I have something at stake and I'm going to try to step in anyway, right? Like that. Yeah. yeah. More of her, more of that. More, right, right. Yeah. Right. And she also, and she's also traumatized now because of it and probably a target for any right, crazy right wing group. Mm-hmm. I think, because I, I think it all goes back to what you were saying earlier, Tisa, about like white liberalism and that concept of of being the neutral party and and that concept of oh my presence here is enough. Like my in the in the film, Phil gives ten thousand dollars to a black teenager to make himself feel better. Like my presence is enough. My money is enough. I don't need to do anything else. And Jose and I have talked a lot about like journalism in general and how the whole notion of neutrality is is what also upholds white supremacy because people of color, black people and people of color cannot be neutral when there's injustice happening to the community. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and and do you find that it's shifting because of all the conversations and protests that have been happening this summer. I mean, it has to. I mean, look at the, what's happening like, with the NBA right now, right? Like, we've gone from you have who, who, who was one of those Fox blonde ladies, probably, who said they all look the same. Who said something like, "Oh, um, LeBron, like he should just shut up and dribble." Wasn't that her well, line? Ingram. Laura Ingram, honey. That yeah, was who that was. Yes, right? that was. Yes. Oh, was it by the Hertz or what's her name? Tommy Laren. Tommy Laren. Oh, who knows how to pronounce that? But um, yeah, just <laughs> shut up and dribble. Like we, the that is a demand for neutrality. That is a demand for you know silence in the face of an injustice that doesn't affect you, right? <laughs> so if it's if it's an injustice that doesn't affect you, right, then you expect everybody else to just shut the fuck up about it, which is not. That's not that ain't it. Like that's not how that works. Like you don't you don't get to tell me to be quiet about something that affects me. <laughs> like that's that's not a thing. And so I think that people. Um, particularly black people right now are like, nah, neutrality ain't, that ain't it. Like that's, that's, <laughs> that is, we have too much at stake now. Like there, and it doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have, right? If you get pulled over by the wrong cop or if you're just jogging in a neighborhood, <laughs> you know, please, Lord, don't let me like get a job out in, in, Portland, right, somewhere and call myself trying to like walk to the grocery store or or whatever. And, you know, because I'm suspicious looking, right, or I've never seen her around here, right, I, there's some vigilante (laughs) person is, you know, out there ready to shoot me, ready to shoot. Like, this is not like, oh, you know, hey, can I help you? Like, are you lost? Do you need directions or whatever? No, 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 no. We skip that all together and just head straight for like, I, I need to like take you out because I already perceive you as a threat. Like that's, <laughs> that's where we are, you know? And like you, who, who, who can remain neutral in that position? Right? Like who, <laughs> who is, who's going to keep their mouth shut? You know, who's going to shut up and dribble? Someone like Phil, I guess. Um, I wonder if, you know, as artists, uh, do you think, because I mean, I obviously I love art and I believe that art can change people's hearts and people's minds and people's souls. Do you uh, believe that? Uh, you know, 
right at this moment in your careers that art can actually change people? I want to, because otherwise I would just, I would just have to jump off a bridge somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, but I do feel a little bit like, um, I wish I were better at anything else, you know, like science, so, you know, I like science. I just, I'm just not very, <laughs> very good at it, right? Something more useful or more practical or more like, um, it, 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 can I, is there a way to like study racism from a scientific perspective? You know what I mean? Like as, as a science, like, is there science behind racism? Surely there is, right? Like, and, um, yeah, if I were good, if I were better at science, maybe I would go that route. But I feel a little bit like, okay, well, I got art. I have words. I have words. That's it. That's all I got. Um, that's all I'm good at. <laughs> so I'm going to have to make this shit work. Like, I'm going to have to make it do what it do. And I can't, um, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, someone hands you a shoelace and a stick of gum and it's like, all right, build a rocket ship, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's, um, that, that's definitely how I feel. I feel ill-equipped. Um, but I do hope, and I am trying every which way I can, right, with my little words, you know, maybe if I put them together this way, huh? <laughs> all right, well, maybe if I, maybe if I did this, huh? You know, <laughs> like, do you care now? Right? Um, have I changed a mind? Have, have I helped anyone? Right? Um, that's what I got. I was new. <laughs> like, I feel like you are more directly plugged into the, because people are actually watching you. And when they see you, like, bring that fierce, ferocious fucking mama energy, like, into the room onto the screen right i feel like you are the i'm like i'm counting on you you know what i mean like that I'm, I'm i'm like all right here are my little words take them and and make them mean something to those people <laughs> right and like that's what you do um and i'm just so appreciative <laughs> i'm so appreciative of that i'm so grateful for you um yeah thank you Thank you. But I, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I think that um, it's imperative for word people like yourself, you know, uh, our word, our words, people um, to, to speak the truth. Um, and I think that's a weapon. And we have to see that as as a weapon in this war that we in that we this war that we are in um and you know i think that i think that what um i think that what ava duvernay did with when with, with when they see us is a perfect example of that um and and the reason why is that she told the truth she told the truth these young men approached her about telling their story she told it and as a result there were consequences and repercussions the folks lost their book deals, folks, folks lost their uh, positions. Um, and that case was, um, was reimagined, had, was reimagined by this country as, um, as a result of that, as a result of that, uh, of that series being on the air. So, you know, if, if, if it were, I wish I want to do this that kind of material all the time because it is it is a means it is a, no it is a weapon in this battle that we are in um and we have to do more of those we have to do more of that truth telling and 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 this this correction that we have to um we have to do um, in terms of how our stories have been told, and it's not stories; it's it's it is it's the, the events that happened to us have been in the mouths of people who who want to erase us. So they're not going to tell the truth. So now we have to do that when we can, and that's what that's what you're doing, Chisa. So don't 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 devalue that at all. Don't even you are you are a soldier in this. 
you know? <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, ma yeah, yeah, did I want that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Support everything that Anjanu just said about your work, <laughs> Chisa. And I was, I'm really wondering for you, Anjanu, because, you know, on, 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 for a few years now, you've been advocating for the removal of the Confederate flag in, in, in Mississippi as an insignia, and they finally removed it this past summer. And so what did this, it's a small victory, but it's something that you've been working really hard for in the grand scheme of things, I'm not saying it was a small, a small campaign. It's like a big deal, but but for you in the grand scheme of things like what did that teach you about like persistence well a couple things for one thing I had I had pretty much given up on it and um I had just said that you know I'm tired I have done everything if I told you the amount of money that I have spent on on that effort you know I could have bought all kinds of shoes bought y'all shoes you know what I mean? Like we, you know, just would have had probably a more um, lush life if I could have some of that money back that I spent on that effort. And, and then the time, and then for quite, to be honest with you, just the depression, just the depression. I've spent many a day not getting out of my bed because I felt, I felt that everything I was doing was futile. And so there's that. And, but here's, here's, here's what I don't think, and I, I understand what you're saying about the grand scheme of things, that it doesn't figure into the grand scheme of things, but here's what people don't, don't get about what, the, what that flag did. What the flag did was the physical presence of that flag was a proxy for segregation. And that's what people don't understand. They just see it as, oh, this is a symbolism of white supremacy. But if you, I'm sure all of you on this call, if you see that flag somewhere, if you are about to go into somewhere to eat at a restaurant and you see that flag outside, you're going to reconsider going in that restaurant. You're going to go somewhere else. And so white folks in Mississippi, they are aware of that. And so that's why they use that flag. They don't have to tell you, you can't come in my restaurant. They just put that flag outside. And then you know, I'm not welcome here. Or if I come in here, I have to, I'm expected to behave a certain way. So that's what people, people don't misunderstand. People misunderstand that, that the flag was a proxy for segregation. And my position is, is we, if we have made segregation illegal in this country, we should not have proxies for it. So there's that. In terms of how I felt about it, you know, um, I had been very depressed for a long time. And I had been quarantining in California. I'm back out here now because I have, I have to finish my job. Hopefully that's why I'm here. But anyway, I was out here quarantining. And so I left to go home in, I guess, late July, early August, and I hadn't been home for a couple months, few months. And I drove home, drove from California to Mississippi. And so when I crossed the county line from Louisiana to Mississippi, and I saw the first uh, flagpole that is financed by the state and did not see that flag on that pole, I, I was dancing, I was singing, I felt like I felt like a weight. I felt like I had lost 35 pounds. I didn't, but I felt like I lost 35 pounds. And 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 really honestly, now I, I still I still feel that way. It took up so much of my life. Do you know what I mean? And now sometimes I sit on the couch and go like, mm, what do I do now? You know what I'm saying? Like. Cause that was, that was, it was what I was supposed to do. And now at least that, at least that part of the battle has been fought and won. Now I did a whole lot of stuff, but the reality is, is that these young men who played football in Mississippi as a result of the torture and murder of George, torture and murder of George Floyd, they said, I'm not playing another game until you guys bring that flag down. It's a young man named Kylan Hill. And Mississippi got two things going for it, the church and football. 
And so they knew that if they, if they lose football in Mississippi, that's it. So they had to do something. They had to, they had to act. And I was so proud because I voted a couple weeks ago and I voted for the new flag. So I was, ha I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm very happy. Congratulations. Amazing. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you for all of your efforts to make sure that the, that hateful symbol is no longer part of any govern government. Thank you. They American. still fly it now. They still fly that flag. They fly the, the Mississippi State flag. They got fresh flags. They just bought them. Bought them, new something, all of that. Because that's where I'm from. That's where I live. But anyway, yes. <laughs> it's like you tear it out of their cold, dead hands. <laughs> you understand? Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, God. And it's not even, it's like such an ugly flag also. I'm, I'm like, you don't, like. It's not cute. No, not at all. <laughs> it's not cute. Um, Even cute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is the part where we wrap up and you uh, plug everything you have going on for yourself. Like, I know that Proof of Love, do, do we know when the subject's coming out uh, on demand? Or we don't have dates for that yet, right? <laughs> we're, we're working on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's making the festival rounds right now and you can follow us on, I think we have like all the, the social media accounts. It's um, at is it the subject film, at the subject film. I'm pretty sure that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, that's, that's where you can find that info. Um, but yeah, we're still looking for a distributor. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, on the show right now that I can't even talk about. And what audio play? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, just all this other stuff that I can't even talk about because it's like pre-production or pre-pre-pre-production. <laughs> um, so yeah. But Proof of Love is on Audible and they can find it there. Right? It's on Audible um, and it's also, I think, published by Dramatist Play Services. Um, yes. What's Proof of Love, uh, Chief? You Proof of that? Love is um, an audio drama that I wrote for Audible. They commissioned me to write a radio play, and it is um, it is about a, a wealthy Black woman of a certain age who um, whose husband has um, is comatose now because he's been in a really horrible car accident, and she, um, over the past few days, has been discovering some things about him and herself in the process. <laughs> oh my God. Um, yeah, and um, so yeah, that is on Audible. It's a very short um, listen. If you have the time, I would love, I <laughs> I would love it if you would to listen. I am, girl. I'm a, I'm, yes, I'm gonna do, if I don't do that, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. That's gonna be my thing I do tomorrow. Yeah. I, that is so <laughs> cool, Chisa. Yeah. That's so great. And do you know Brenda Presley? Yeah, I feel like I do know Brenda Presley. Is that who played? Like everyone, everyone, everyone black in the theater has worked with Brenda Presley at some point, I feel like. I just need to see her. I just need to, let me just see her face. Mm -hmm. she, yeah. um, she is narrating it and she is a goddess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun stuff. That yeah, she, yeah. She's cool. Yeah, we saw, I, I, saw her, I, I saw her do it live on stage for 90 minutes and it was riveting. Yeah, and I was I like, I couldn't believe it was her after seeing Shirley, Good and Mercy. And then I was like, this is, this. she's a chameleon. I was like, she is. Uh, she's she incredible. She was in another play literally just before the live production of the Audible play. She was in another play playing a completely different character, completely different. Like a lunch lady. <laughs> <laughs> a lunch lady from Newark, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> she's dope. She's dope. I'm, I see who you're talking about. She's mm -hmm. dope. Yeah, you know <laughs> and, and what about you? Lovecraft Country is on HBO every Sunday, and you have some movies coming up soon, and also yeah. secret projects. <laughs> now I have no secrets. <laughs> I have no secrets. Hopefully we'll be, hopefully we can finish this uh, King Richard movie and, um, and that'll come out at some point. 
So wish us luck. Yes. Wish us luck. Break a leg and fingers crossed and everything. Yeah, and good luck on getting HBO to try to work with the Emmett Till Foundation. Can you, thank you. If, I'm serious, if you guys have ideas about how I can approach these people, because yo, I mean, I, I ain't gonna talk about them on your, it's, it's, a, it's a different, it's a different, it's, it's a corporate. Different, it's yeah. corporate, that's the word. It's a corporate, mm -hmm. it's corporate. They're, you know, I'm wonderful in what they put on air, but I think we have to take responsibility for this, you know, the civic engagement that Lovecraft sort of commands, you know? So. I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm surprised they haven't done any civic engagement because all these companies are all about like doing social good programming next to their actual programming these days. Yeah, well, that's what we got to push them to do more of, I think. Yeah, yeah. Because like also Watchmen had the same social element that they didn't really like take beyond the uh, awards and all of that but that's not our story like that's yeah, a as a Vietnamese thing. person I have opinions on Watchmen but I'm not going to talk about them officially oh <laughs> Ooh, I would, but let's we need to do to talk about it again so because I want to know <laughs> uh, thank you both so much uh the subject is really wonderful and you're great in it and she said your words are always like, you know, like sent from the heavens. So thank you both for joining us so much and have a great rest of your um, year and month and week and quarantine. I hope this is over so we can go to the theater very soon. I hope so too. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank to you. Thank you both so much. Thank you.